so-called beach safe, you uh, then have to go to a tanker for approximately an hour, uh, gassing up and topping off your airplane to go back to the carrier, because it's another 500 miles or so from there to get back to the uh, carrier. In that time, there's a tendency or a possibility to relax and uh, uh, your adrenaline level goes down. However, you still have to uh, land on the carrier, and that's always the uh, final thing that a Navy pilot has to do. So the relaxation uh, lasts for a little while, but that can also put you into a uh, lackadaisical mode, knowing uh, that you still have to land on the carrier. You've got to get that adrenaline pump back up again. assets in the military arsenal is the aircraft carrier. With the carrier, 60 of the world's premier attack and air-to-air -air fighters can be on station, ready to project power at a moment's notice. This mobile airfield can make the difference for a military commander, from keeping the sea lanes open to supporting the strategic initiatives of war. here. Uh, we have the carrier to launch. We can move the carrier around to different places. Uh, we have uh, a lot of flexibility in that uh, we've got all types of aircraft co-located right here in the air wing. Uh, for different types of missions, we can pull uh, people together in one spot, get them all briefed up within a couple of hours and get on the way. Assure that some, sometimes very difficult because you have different aircraft based in different places. The coordination out here, uh, in many cases, is much easier because we have everybody here within a thousand feet on the carrier and we can pull it all together and, and get over there in a hurry. When it pulls out of port, it's a full up airfield, full up round, ready to not only defend itself, but ultimately, and its primary mission is to, to project power. Uh, all the ordinances there, it doesn't have to be shipped over. All the aircraft are there, all the air crew, all the fuel, everything required to uh, project power at a moment's notice. air wing on a carrier is around 60 aircraft, uh, it's made up of a, a couple of F-14 squadrons, a couple of F-18 squadrons, uh, one A-6, a couple of carriers have two A-6 squadrons on them, uh, an EA-6B squadron, an E-2 squadron, and an S-3 squadron, and then the, uh, the SH-3 uh, Hilo squadron. The mission of the F-14 is uh, it's the Navy's premier fighter. Primarily, it's a fighter first and uh, provides uh, air superiority and fleet air defense for uh, the carrier battle group. The principal mission for the F-18 is power projection ashore. Uh, we are we, we train equally to the, the fighter mission and the air-to-ground mission, but I'd say our major emphasis would be uh, dropping bombs, and the air-to-air -air would come in in more of a self-escort role uh, to where we don't have to have uh, of fighters going in with us, we can take care of ourselves, basically. All right, it's a two-place, obviously, side-by-side, -side, uh, all-weather attack aircraft carry uh, roughly eight tons of ordnance, which is a, is a good bit more than some other aircraft in theater. The airborne controllers are all in the uh, E-2C, the uh, Hawkeye, and uh, those, those guys are and the F-14, F-18 guys all work together fairly closely for, uh, for the uh, air defense role. The EA-6B Prowler is a uh, jamming platform. Uh, it provides uh, some uh, electronic surveillance and some uh, electronic uh, jamming of, of, of different frequency bands. The SH-3 on the ship is kind of a jack of all trades. It's the primary mission was anti-submarine. It's our SAR platform. If anybody goes down, the, uh, the SH-3 is probably going to be who's going to pick you up. I picked S-3s uh, out of the training command. It's like a chess game. You go out there and you look for an enemy submarine, and there's a lot of satisfaction going out there and finding the guy submerged 
and tracking him, having the ability to, should he become a threat, to, to take him out, should, should that need arise at any given time. Omar Zero Niner, fly, text crash, one two five without delay. Hundreds of miles from the nearest ocean, individual air squadrons will come together to form a complete air wing. In the deserts of Nevada, pilots will train for the missions that will give the carrier the power it will ultimately project from the sea. Yeah, the carrier air wing team is something that, uh, that once you're on a deployment, uh, it has to work together good in, in order to accomplish its, its mission. Uh, in preparing for that, the, uh, the air wing is generally broken down into its individual squadrons. They do unit level training so that they're on the step with their individual mission. The air wing will get together and start doing air wing training, which uh, culminates with a uh, detachment out to Fallon, Nevada, where everyone gets together all the different warfare specialties and they they integrate the air wing itself. Well, out at Fallon, you'll plan uh, different types of uh, simulated type missions. Uh, the entire air wing, the, uh, the FNA-18s, the A-6s, the F-14s, the A-6s, the E-2s, the S-3s, everyone will go through their little part in, uh, in attacking whatever your, your assigned mission that day or for that particular strike is. They'll, they'll plan it, play it out, and then they'll go fly it on a range that has the capability for the air crew to debrief to go back and look at what they've, what they've done the air wing can get some idea of how, how everything's playing together. We Fallon is a remote area uh, with a lot of airspace. We have a supersonic area out there. And, and it's over land. That's one thing a lot of Navy guys don't get a lot of practice with, particularly East Coast Navy, is uh, most of our flying's out over the water. So it's a chance to, to look at some overland work with radars and uh, terrain masking and, and those type things. Following that, the, uh, the air wing will move on to the ship, and then you start into uh, both some shipboard operations, and uh, that advances on up into some battle group operations where there are all the different other ships kind of join together and, and the whole uh, Navy team, surface, subsurface, and uh, aviation teams all get together to form an effective battle group. You have to train in a lot of different scenarios as far as parts of the world. I mean, a typical East Coast cruise could have the carrier in the med off the coast of uh, Lebanon, say, next to you know, a week later it could be off the coast of Libya, then it could uh, come around and go up into the North Atlantic and be working off the fjords of, uh, of Norway. At sea, from the expanse of the desert to the close confines of the aircraft carrier, the differences in size, space, and intensity are pronounced, and for the pilot, the transition is always dramatic. Probably since we're uh, down below for so long, we don't get we don't get on deck unless it's really unless we're going to fly. Uh, first thing I notice when I come on deck is just the uh, just the intense wind and all the activity. Uh, it, it's like a whole different world up there. So you get up and you just get this feeling like I'm gearing up to fly. It's something in. Uh, it's just a great feeling. Uh, you're walking along the flight deck and there's uh, carts moving all around and people are towing aircraft, getting them in uh, their, their position for launch and uh, there's a lot of activity. You're on board and what you're doing is, is the whole reason the carrier's there. So it, it's kind of a, it's a really awesome feeling. I mean, everybody up there in a sense, is, uh, is working so that you can you can get off the jack and, and, and go drop your bombs. Even the you know even the all the guys on there, you know, 5,500 guys on the ship, and uh, and it, it's to help you get in your jet and go launch your bombs. And it, uh, it it's definitely a good feeling. The 
worst thing with the flight deck is, is that it, it's real noisy. It, it can be uh, slick. The ship's moving through the, the water, making you know making its own way, and it likes to turn into the wind. So you've got 30 knots of wind over the flight deck. So you've just got natural wind out over there blowing you all the time. And you've got turning aircraft. You've got your ear protection and all that on. So you really don't hear a lot other than just engines turning. So you, know, you could turn around and walk right into uh, an intake of an airplane or have an airplane turn when you're back to, you know, when you're not facing it, turn its exhaust to you, blow you over or knock you off balance. Uh, you've got E2s that have turning props, uh, the helos when their rotors are turning, all that stuff's all extremely dangerous. And uh, the people learn real fast that you don't take anything for granted, that you're all, you keep your head on a swivel when you're, you're walking around looking, you know, taking care of your buddy because if a guy doesn't see something going on, you'll always see a guy come grab a guy to kind of make sure he sees that a guy's going to turn his exhaust to blow on him or something. Coming back, it's not only just land on the ship, which is uh, obviously one of the hardest things to do is in aviation, but once you're on the flight deck taxiing around with that many aircraft, it's still a possibility where guys have gone over the side just by uh, a director not directing properly or the aircraft sliding due to the fact that the non-skid, which is a gritty paint that we have on the flight deck, uh, sometimes gets worn and can't hold the tires. Three fighters deliver the carrier's punch. The F-14 Tomcat, the F-A-18 Hornet, and the A-6 Intruder. The only single-seater in the carrier arsenal, the F-A-18 Hornet is a versatile fighter that flies both the air-to-air -air and the air-to-ground attack mission. The A-6 Intruder, now over 25 years old, is the stalwart all-weather attacker for the Navy. The F-14, aging but vigorous, flies the huge AIM-54 missile and provides air defense for the fleet in the air-to-air -air role. The best thing the F-14 F has going for it is that it has a, a real powerful radar own airborne tanker carries a lot of fuel, can stay airborne a, a good amount of time, and it's got a lot of performance. It's, uh, it's the fastest airplane the Navy has flying. platform flying that carries the, the uh, AIM-54 Phoenix missile, which is a long-range air-to-air missile, and it gives the F-14 a lot of capability that uh, other aircraft don't have. Uh, underneath the nose of the F-14 is uh, the TCS, which is a television camera set, which uh, it it's, it's basically gives the airplane uh, magnification capability, a, uh, a contrast type of lock to uh, lock on targets at range and, uh, and magnify them. And, and ID what they are. The most current series of the F-14 is the F-14D. The F-14D, uh, the, the big improvement there is with, uh, with the weapon system. It's uh, a lot more digital technology incorporated into the weapon system. It has, uh, it has the, the higher thrust GE engines in it. It, uh, it, it has a lot, of, a lot of different sensors in it that, that give it a lot more capability. As decreed by the uh, Secretary of the Navy, the, uh, the future of naval aviation is, uh, is, is the uh, F-18 Hornet, and uh, it, there will be some version of that probably developed that will end up replacing the, uh, the F-14 and the current F-18s we have. The AX is envisioned as the replacement for the A-6, and uh, so uh, future carriers, future air wings, and the uh, 21st century should have some complement of uh, F-18 type aircraft and uh, an AX type aircraft. The 
What's really nice about the F-18 is it, it can protect itself. It's extremely survivable, very, very high speed airplane, very survivable, and it's got a swing roll. You either drop bombs or you're a fighter guy. Another part of it that's very, very good, it's, it's easy to maintain. So when you come back and land the airplane, you put gas in it and it's ready to launch again. A6 is an all-weather bomber. It's the only one that the Navy owns. So we, we can fly uh, in, in the rain. Uh, we fly mostly at night. And the cloud cover really doesn't affect us that much. We need, uh, uh, we use our radar to, to target in, a, in the target area. And so it doesn't hurt us that badly. We can be a little more accurate if we can use our, uh, our FLIR uh, for detection and ranging. Uh, we, can, we can be a little bit more accurate. But, but the weather really doesn't affect us that much. Uh, the weather only hurts us getting our strike groups together. The A6 also flies the tanker mission uh, on occasion. Uh, like I said, there's always a lot of activity and you have to, you know, follow a plane around. If he's getting to be a low state after he's had a few approaches, and uh, you have to position yourself almost perfectly so that if he bolters again, then he can look up and go right where, you know, he's expecting to be, which is at the 1 to 2 o'clock position. Tanking can be, uh, <laughs> this, is one, this is one of those things where once you get good at it, uh, we we like to kind of press the bubble and, and see how quickly we can get in the basket and uh, with how much flare we can do it. Uh, but it, let's say you've had a 14-day lay layover in Palma, Palma, Spain, and you haven't uh, touched the stick, and now you're back in the cockpit again. Uh, it can be a, a flail wreck, you know, snakes in the cockpit, and you're you're trying to get in and out of the basket, and you know all your buddies are watching you out there, hanging off the, the A6's wing, and they're laughing because you can't get in the basket. But normally it's uh, normally it's a pretty easy evolution, and we you know, we kind of enjoy it. The BN is obviously at least sit, sitting right next to me, and uh, you know, I can look at him when we're flying. We can, uh, we can talk back and forth. It's kind of comfortable to see the guy sitting right next to you as opposed to just hearing a voice over your uh, intercom system and knowing he's sitting behind you. Great airplane. 
Naval air combat, the cat launch, the enemy engagement, and finally, the recovery back on deck. All in all, one of the most demanding missions in military aviation. The way a mission would start on the ship is you would, uh, you would end up You'd end up briefing your mission specifics with the other air crew, other aircraft that are going with you. Then you would go into uh, maintenance control, and the uh, the maintenance chief at the desk there would present you with the uh, the aircraft discrepancy book. You would go through the book, look at all the you know, saying everything that's safe for flight has been serviced. Uh, any problems that the last air crew or last few air crews have had with the airplane would all be documented, and what was done to fix that and any other outstanding uh, problems with the airplane. And then you would uh, you would leave maintenance control, go up on the flight deck uh, where you would meet your plane captain. Uh, the Air Force calls it a crew chief. The Navy calls it a plane captain. Approaching the aircraft, I'm just taking a general look around. Uh, just to get an overall feel, okay, is there, you know, how the tires look? You know, just kind of a general, there's my bird. And uh, do I see any glaring errors before I get down and, uh, and uh, get into the detail of the pre-flight? Our jets probably in about 10 minutes, and then uh, generally the, uh, the startup is 30 minutes prior to the scheduled launch. So we'll be in our jets and get, be ready to uh, start 30 minutes prior to the scheduled launch. Uh, 30 minutes prior, the uh, um, the air boss, as he's affectionately known, calls away the start for all the jets that are involved in that launch. Everybody starts up, does all their uh, pre-flight checks in the jet, and uh, gets ready to go. And then there's sort of a uh, ballet on the uh, flight deck, if you will, as the planes uh, get, uh, get situated. If the ship's out in heavy seas where it's rocking and rolling, uh, yeah, you can feel the motion quite a bit. It's actually sometimes pretty exciting to try to taxi when, uh, when the airplane's uh, pitching and uh, rolling. I'd be firing on uh, the, uh, one of the bow catapults on the uh, starboard side, known as Catapult 1. Uh, the catapult officer will be situated on my left side, about my 10 o'clock position. Uh, I would notice that there would be a couple of uh, a couple of the catapult crew running out from underneath the plane. They've just hooked up our uh, holdback fitting and our uh, tow link that will uh, attach us to the shuttle, which actually um, pulls us down the uh, catapult. Uh, as they run out, the uh, catapult, sitting, or catapult officer will be looking up and down the flight deck to make sure that everything's clear. He'll indicate that we should uh, uh, go into tension, as it's called. I'll Make sure our hydraulic uh, pressure is good, our oil pressure is good. The uh, catapult officer will be still standing out there waiting for uh, my salute, which indicates that uh, we're ready to go as a crew. Uh, I'll wipe out the controls, move the stick uh, to touch all four corners, uh, move the rudders back and forth to make sure that the controls aren't binding, make sure we have no other, uh, no other warnings or cautions that uh, indicate there's a problem with the airplane. When uh, all that's complete, the BN is ready to go. Uh, I'll look over to the catapult officer salute him. He'll uh, return my salute. He'll uh, once again look up and down the uh, deck to make sure that uh, all is clear, holding the uh, throttles up at full power. And uh, I'll notice when he'll lean down and touch the deck, indicating that uh, we're going to be shot. A couple seconds later, I'll feel the acceleration, and uh, it's just the greatest ride in the world.
old cat when you're getting shot off the uh, the front end that you need a certain airspeed for you to go flying or to even keep the airplane flying. Maybe they can, you know, you're getting shot off the front end at 60 feet, so you've got maybe maybe 50 feet you can play with there. I've had the kind that you go off the end and you drop 30 or 40 feet, and uh, you realize it's not a complete call because you felt the kick and you're used to that. But at the same time, it wasn't what you what you thought, and uh, and it, it, it scares you. situation when you go up on this strike tonight he is going to have a trap set for you with fighters he's going to have all the sams firing at you and you have to set it up for the worst case and you can never really relax so as far as being lucky you know i think that it's more a professional competence of the tactics we're using and what we're doing i was the far right hand hornet in my group and uh was responsible for lookout out that direction saw a flash down on the ground and a cloud of sand and we'd always been briefed about what it would look like but first thing I thought of was hey there's a flare being shot and then it started to rise up and as it was coming up I saw it begin to pull lead on my airplane and knowing that most of their SAMs have proportional navigation I realized it was tracking me so I not knowing whether it was an infrared SAM or a, uh, a radar SAM I put up both chaff and flares put the SAM on my beam so there was no closure or opening from the SAM and all of a sudden, it was no longer pulling lead on me. It started to drift behind my airplane. Actually passed through my altitude and detonated above my altitude. People were calling them out left and right. You know, smoke on the left, smoke on the right. And you could look down and see them coming right up at you. It was incredible. It was, I'd never seen anything like it. It'd be wrong to say it wasn't just a little bit terrifying. You know, somebody's shooting at you. But at the same time, you, uh, you reach a point where you do the same thing you've trained to do all the time and you, I won't say you block it out, you recognize it's there and you recognize the risk, but you go ahead and do what you want to do. Uh, we're pretty careful about particularly telling the young guys like Jim that there's a trade-off between getting the mission done and taking the risk. And we try not, we try to teach our guys not to take an unacceptable risk. And in fact, a lot of the missiles that are fired are not guided. Uh, and a lot of them that are fired aren't aimed at you, even though it may look like it. But uh, if, if you really think you're in danger, then you may not drop the bombs right then. You may make a maneuver. You may do whatever's required to try to defeat that and then try to get on to do your job. Navy uh, primarily would work uh, the F-14 as a uh, section or two aircraft. Uh, you know, 
when available, some missions you would work as a division or four plane, but uh, routine missions off the ship, you'd work as a section within squadrons. There may be another section from the other squadron going to a different station. Routinely, we work with our Aegis cruisers, uh, destroyers, and use them to uh, provide uh, early uh, pointers as to where the uh, hostile aircraft are, and then, then basically we put our radars on them and uh, other sensors and then uh, require contact. We normally like to deploy uh, on a strike mission in a four-plane uh, type formation. We like to call it a battle box. The reason for that is there's a better lookout doctrine. We, we are able to support each other better in that kind of formation than, than in a two-plane, which just isn't enough aircraft uh, in an enemy environment. Popeye and I watched during a day hop, and probably about three miles after we took off, we, uh, we had a firelight, and that was that's an automatic engine shutdown. So we had to climb up overhead and shut the engine down and, and uh, set up a single engine. Because it was blue water, you know, normally they, they, the skipper of the boat will make a decision whether he wants to divert the airplane or take it aboard. Well, blue water ops means that there is no option of divert, so we had to land with just one engine. And because it was an extremely hot day, we had to dump a lot of gas and leave us enough gas for two attempts at landing. And if we couldn't have gotten aboard on the second try, we would have had to turn around and come in barricade. Uh, that was pretty exciting. And as it turns out, it was a legitimate firelight, so uh, shutting the engine down right away was, was the right move trapped on the first one, it was a fairly decent pass. Uh, you always remember when something like that happens, everybody in the ship knows what's going on. Towards the end, we did start doing some what we call them um, hot boxes or whatever. Um, and this was basically going and getting a uh, 60 by 60 mile area. And we were told that we were allowed to drop on pretty much anything that was in there. Uh, we used our air to ground radar to pick up uh, bright returns. We would know from intel prior to launch where there might be artillery batteries or tank concentrations. And uh, once we had that, we would compare our radar lock to our forward-looking infrared pod and be able to get a visual pick day or night on, on what we were dropping, and then we'd release an ordinance. We had uh, several F-18s, I should say several, uh, four actually hit overseas. Uh, they were all hit by uh, heat-seeking missiles. Uh, and all four of those airplanes were flying again within uh, two days. They all flew back to our home base, which was about 250 miles from the battlefield. And uh, three of those four flew back on two engines, and the other one uh, came back same much. The air-to-air -air mission is much more intense. Getting geared up for an air-to-air -air hop, let's say a, a, a four ship versus uh, many or unknown out there, uh, you've got a lot on your mind. There are, there are so many things you need to do, and, and you're really on your toes the whole time. With a strike mission, there's, there's not so... Uh, everything's kind of laid out. You have a certain timeline you're on. You have a target. You know where you're going. You have a destination. You have some en route time there where you, where you may not have to be as quite on your toes as you do in an air-to-air -air mission. Uh, of course, depending upon the enemy threat, but I'd have to say definitely that in the F-18, at least for me, the air-to-air -air mission is, is more difficult and more demanding. Most of the missions flown from the uh, ship end up staying over water almost entirely. And there are some, especially uh, blue water, operating in the Atlantic uh, where, I mean, you never see land. You take off, you can fly for uh, 600 miles and, uh, and never see land. When we launch, normally uh, we go to, a, in the ASW, which is anti-submarine warfare mission, we go out uh, alone uh, and look for submarines, or we might be working with a surface ship that has, uh, that's an ASW uh, ship, or uh, some of the ASW helicopters. Now in the ASUW, which is anti-surface warfare, we would go out as the uh, tip of the spear, so to speak, and find the, the bad guys and uh, continue to provide the targeting information, and we could do that by ourselves with another S-3, or lead the uh, strike package, which, uh, you know, it could be F-18s or A-6s uh, against other ships, but uh, uh, more and more with, with this new radar that we have, uh, we find ourselves being the ones that are, that are tasked to go out there and, and uh, find a specific unit and maintain the uh, 
missile that we have, we have the capability of taking that ship out, or if it's a heavily defended battle group, uh, uh, going out there ahead of the, uh, of, uh, the strike package and, and, and relaying the targeting data, either shooting uh, our harpoons uh, with, with the strike package or uh, vectoring uh, a strike package in there.
have to pull some power off at a certain point. We're on another one. You might have to put it on. But uh, once you touch down and roll out, um, they're all pretty much about the same. Obviously, some of them have a lot less flight deck than others, like being on the coral sea. You roll out, you'd be looking out at the water you know, right away. That's, you know, that was an eye-opener the first time we did that. But uh, on the bigger ships, you touch down or you, you, know, you cross the ramp, you know you're going to land. It seems like there's a couple of extra seconds there before you actually do touch down. Then when you do roll out, you, know, you have a lot of space left. So. And that's noticeable. I have about uh, 500 traps. Over 200 of those are at night, and I can tell you one thing, not one of them was fun. You know, at 2 a.m., pitch black, there's, uh, there's no moon, and it's bad weather, the deck's kind of moving a little bit, and uh, you've, got, you've got a guy out there on the bow with two little wands, and he's trying to get your nose wheel six inches uh, from the bow and turn you in a 180-degree turn to park you after you've just had a two-hour flight and your legs are shaking from the landing. So I'd have to say that almost the, the scarier part of the flight is is the taxing around the bow afterwards. I think there's a lot of guys that would agree with that. No matter if you're a admiral in the Navy and you're flying behind a boat or whatever, you're always graded. Every pass is graded. And that pass, uh, not only is it graded, but it's posted where uh, the, the entire world can see it. coordination, concentration, and discipline. The tactical advantages gained by the mobility of the carrier ultimately come down to the pilot. For that pilot, the training is continuous, the margin of error slim, and the need for readiness constant. Mm -hmm. 